Hey everybody, and welcome to another JASP tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about how to do a confirmatory factor analysis. So this video came about because on my exploratory factor analysis JASP tutorial, I was specifically asked, and I really love this kind of feedback, I was specifically asked if I could do a tutorial in JASP on how to do and read a confirmatory factor analysis. So I messed around with some data, and I went through, and I taught myself a little bit how to do it. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and um, do this tutorial with the understanding that I have limited knowledge in all of the stuff regarding confirmatory factor analyses, but I can explain it in a way that will allow you to explore it more on your end in JASP. Now, as always, I am using the most recent build of JASP, uh, 0 0.14.1, and so let's open some data and get right into it. Okay, so you can see here that I have um, the SAQ open. What is the SAQ? Well, this is Andy Field's uh, hypothetical but, but actualized uh, SPSS anxiety questionnaire. And so he developed this, um, and there are like 23 questions on this. It's in several other uh, either Jasper or Jamovi uh, tutorials that I have on this on this channel. But in this particular one, it's good because we can use the confirmatory factor analysis function, this mo the module in Jasp, to explore this. And you can see here that um, I have all of these agrees and strongly disagrees. However, one thing you'll note um, when you open, when you open a file that is pretty much just Likert scales here, Likert scale items, questions that have um, one through five or one through seven, but they are whole numbers. Jasp will read them as ordinal, and um, we have to we have to we have to change that, right? So we're we're going to click on all of these to change them to scales, and when we do this, you'll see that the labels disappear and the numbers are the only ones that are left. So uh, I'm going to cut here. Okay, so here you see I've changed them all to scale, and now that's just a bunch of uh, spreadsheet of numbers, one through five. Uh, agreement scale is what was used here, um, and so I cut just so you didn't have to see all of that. So let's go ahead and. Um, do the factor analysis. So we're gonna go up to factor and we are gonna click on that. There we go. And uh, we click on confirmatory factor analysis. So the reason why we would do a confirmatory factor analysis and not a principal components or exploratory factor analysis is because we already have our factor model idea. We already have figured it out. And so we have a new set of data and now we need to test whether or not our, our factor model is good uh, sort of on a theoretical level. Like it, does it actually make sense and do new samples of data fit that factor model. And so the statistics that we get in confirmatory factor analysis are going to tell us that. And so um, we are going to do a modified version of the uh, SAQ scale. I'm not going to be doing all of it. So uh, full disclosure, I am using the um, CFA uh, uh, tutorial from um, the stats department at UCLA, uh, the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, and they use a modified SAQ eight version and so they use um number uh, items one through eight instead of all of them although in the r tutorial they get some they, i think they get rid of number seven or number two or something like that an item gets ends up getting dropped off of this but in any case um we are doing that and the reason why i chose this that r example from ucla is because the data was available the saq data is available and then two um because jasp uses r as the foundational engine for doing these statistics the a confirmatory factor analysis package, and I'll, here I'll show you when I, if I open I here, the um, analysis package here is Lavan, and that's the main package for uh, this confirmatory factor analysis model. And then it uses some elements of ggplot2, which is a fantastic visualization um, package, and then semplot again for SEM models, which you'll see in just a second. Um, R shape is another plotting uh, package, and then the basic stats to get uh, you know things like covariances and means and things like that. So um, the vast majority of the calculation is going to be coming from Lavan. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to use this example because many of the output you'll see here comes from that. Okay, so we're gonna skip all of the analysis stuff. So what I want to do is I want to show you the two-factor model, which is the which is the actual model that we are going to use um, as a way to make this uh, tutorial work uh, because the one-factor model is wrong. Um, and I can show you how to uh, end up how you end up doing this um toward, at the end but let's go ahead and use the the two factor model shall we okay so in factor one yeah i was um looking through the output in the example on ucla i'll link the, the actual stuff in the description down below Th they get rid of question two it was in the original saq8 i don't know why it was dropped in the two factor model but we're gonna grab question one question three four five and eight now um the I these actual items are on the ucla linked down in the uh the description below um, so you can know what those actual items are but just be aware that they are all um, on this single factor and we'll show we'll, we'll talk about these uh, these results in just a second so let me grab six and seven I'm using command to hold on to them them uh, to individually select and that's what I used for this because you can you, you, know, you see I'm on Mac but um, for Windows that would be control to individually select shift works the same on both uh, major OS's okay so we have our two factors set up and you can see that by default we have the one factor and we have this plus or minus sign here. So 
if we want to add a factor to our structure, then we hit the plus. If we want to subtract a, a, a factor from our structure, we hit minus there. Okay, so let's go through some of these options uh, to make sure that we have what we need to determine whether or not this is a, a good... Okay, so let's go through the options to make sure that um, we have all the information we need to make a good conclusion, to make a, a conclusion based on the data instead of something that we want. So um, we have a number of options here. So second order factors, now the last... Uh, the the last example on this UCLA R CFA page does go through second order factor example. Um, if you wanted to do a second order factor, then you would choose one of these to be the second order. So it is sort of like a linear fashion, a hierarchical um, factor model as opposed to simultaneous factor model, which you'll see in the um, in the plots in just a second when I add plots to this output. We are going to skip that for this basic tutorial because I kind of want to jump to the the stats here. So model options, um, we are going to assume that um, the factor scaling is based on factor variances as opposed to whether we have a marker variable or an effects coding. So we're going to use the variances of each of the factors to scale all of the items within their factors. So we are going to leave that as default. Additional outputs, we definitely want additional fit measures because that's where we get our indices that we need as well as our, our um, the RMSCA, which is the root, root mean square error of approximation. For some reason, that is not on by default, but you kind of need that. The chi-square test doesn't really tell you the whole story. Um, and you can get R squared values for each of your items if you want to grab those. So we'll click that. And then here are some additional matrices and indices if you need that. And then if you really wanted to um, port this to R or R Studio, you can go ahead and have the Levon syntax for this particular setup show at the bottom. And here it is. So this is the, the last place that I'll show you. And so you could highlight this. As long as you load in the data and you name it um, uh, appropriately, then throwing this syntax in immediately will give you the output that, you know, the plain text output that you get in tabular form. Uh, Multigroup CFA is not what we are doing here, so we're going to ignore that. Plots. Now, um, I don't uh, generally, when I do uh, factor analyses, do not grab misfit plots, but I'm going to show that just in case. Um, but we definitely do want the model plot, and we're going to show parameters. Um, but we don't want to. We don't really care for showing means because I would prefer the um, factor loadings from factors onto items, um, and those will form. Uh, as you can see, the plot just showed up. Um, the plot just showed up, so that was nice. Um, I kind of do want just the parameters, the factor loadings um, between factors and uh, between you know the items themselves. Now, if we the last one here is um, advanced, uh, you can emulate what M plus, which is an HLM uh, program, M plus will give you, or EQS, which is an SEM, a structural equation model program. So these two things are separate programs that you would have to pay a license for. Um, you can emulate uh, those. Uh, by default, none is selected, and you can see that it's a radio button. Now, estimators is usually auto, but if you want maximum likelihood, then you would uh, click that. But if you wanted um, general, uh, gen uh, general, uh, generalized least squares, weighted least squares, unweighted least squares, or um, double weighted least squares, I think. I'm not sure what DWLS is. Um, you can do error calculation with confidence intervals by 95%. I mean, that's convention, and that is by default. And so the standard would, the method of um, error calculation would either be standard robust, or you can do bootstraps and put that in. I'm not going to do bootstraps, but that is, generally speaking, a good idea to do bootstraps confidence intervals, because then you can add the number of bootstraps in here. So you could do simulations of like 1,000, 5,000, whatever your computer can do. This is an older computer, so I'm not going to ask it to do any simulations. Even though as a computer, it should probably be able to do that. I don't want Jasp to crash. And then you can standardize, and you can go through a standardization CFA um, if you want. Uh, generally, if you are writing this to just talk about the SEM or the CFA in a paper um, after you've done a, an, um, an EFA, an exploratory factor analysis, you don't generally need to use these. But as far as I'm aware, I could be wrong about that, but you don't generally need to use these. They're just options for a more advanced uh, CFA. So let's close all of those and talk about this output. Okay. So there are three, generally three, potentially four, although um, two of the four are used sort of half and half. Um, you use either either or in this case. So all right, let's, let's talk about these. So we have our model fit, and this is a chi-squared test. And so we're looking at the factor model itself, and we get a chi-square value, and we have degrees of freedom for that value. And so we can look up what 13 degrees of freedom is with um, whatever our n is, and um, we get our, you know, compared to our chi-square, and we get a p-value. So what this p-value is telling you is um, using, really using chi-square null hypothesis testing um, language is you're saying that... Um, there is enough evidence here to suggest that we reject the null hypothesis that this is not a good fit. And so we're saying that this factor structure is a good fit for the data. That is, items 1, 3, 4, and 5, and 8 out of the 8 items does fit a single factor. They're all related to one another. They fit that single factor. And that factor 2 is, six, is item 6 and item 7. And we have some good evidence to suggest that is the case. Unfortunately, chi-square is, um, uh, is, is very sensitive to n, uh, the amount of, of items that, or excuse me, not the amount of items, the amount of, uh, of cases that you have in the data. So you end up, um, you end up with, a, if you have a huge n, you end up with, um, you know, chi-square coming out with, uh, yeah, this is a really good fit. Yeah, this is a really good fit. Yeah, this is a really good fit. And you're like, oh, is it really, is it, is it a good fit though? So this is where the other additional fit measures come in. Of course, chi-square is the main test, but these additional fit indices or measures 
are what are appropriate. Now, uh, we're only going to focus on the top two here, the CFI and the TLI. These are the two that I said are interchangeable slash you use one or the other. And most of the time you see people use CFI and not TLI. So the comparative fit index or the Tucker Lewis index. Now we have values here that uh, approach one. And the idea is uh, with CFI is that anything greater than 0.95 is perceived to be a good fit. It's that is a good fit. And one is uh, exact fit or something like that. Uh, so this is, you can see, greater than 0.95. So by convention, we're saying, yes, this is a good fit. Anything less than 0.9, no good. Anything less than 0.9 is no good. So that's just convention. Um, uh, 0.9 to 0.95 is a good cutoff. Uh, so, you know, if you use 0.95, you can also use 0.9. Either any, in either case on this value here is we're looking good. Same thing with um, the Tucker Lewis sort of has a, a, a similar set of um, 0.95, 0.9 kind of, you know, if you want you want to be high, you want to be in the 0.9 and higher range. Although, um, again, 0.95 is probably the better, the more conservative fit cutoff than 0.9. 0.9 is more liberal and you might get some, you know, if you're trying to say 0.9 being a good fit, um, if your chi-square is good, then you might have some hardliners, reviewers say, oh, no, nah, nah, I don't think so. So, you know, 0.95 being more conservative on these two measures is probably a good idea. And then we have other fit measures that um, I am not too sure of. So I don't know how often they are mentioned in the literature. They do exist, though. Now, uh, we are going to skip information criteria, but this is the log likelihood. So that's the maximum likelihood um, uh, value here. Um, and you can get other measures there, the AAC, the BIC. But I really want to uh, end with um, the root mean square error of approximation, the RMSCA. This one now is the opposite. You want, because this is an error approximation, we want this number to be small, as close to zero as possible. So we're sort of in the opposite direction to be perceived as a good fit. The RMSCA, um, you're looking for values that are closer to zero, but 0.1 is your, essentially your cutoff. So here we have 0 0.04, 0 0.1 is your cutoff. So the idea that, I, uh, that um, 0.1 is your cutoff is you want values that are less than 0.1. Okay, now 0.5 is a good idea. Anything less than 0 0.05 reflects a good fit. Point, between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1, you end up with that gray area of like, ooh, is, um, you know, it's, it's almost this idea, it's almost this question of, oh boy, is this a, a marginal, which is not real, right? Um, a marginal effect or, or trending effect. And so you would need a, a better idea. And if, if we looked at the, um, just the one factor output of this model, like I'll show here at the end, the, you can, because we're not partialing out how six, item six and item seven pair together as another factor, this value is going to be much higher than this 0.04. You get a um, confidence interval for 90%. Uh, you cannot change that. So it's a 90% confidence interval. Um, and so you can see here, it's between 0.03 and 0.05. And you get a p-value for this value here. You get a p-value. You can see this p-value is um, way or way, definitely not going to be rejecting the null here. Uh, if So you obtain a p-value for the close fit. If you reject this RMSCA, it means your model isn't a close fitting model, but we can sometimes ignore this p value because the RMSCA is pretty good. And when you compare that to the CFI and the TLI and the chi square outcome, then we can sort of ignore the fact that this uh, RMSCA p value is approximating one, which is, is not a big deal. Um, and so, how we want to look at this is we've got the model fit, the model test fit, which is the chi square. Um, we have the additional fit uh, measures that we we're talking about. So, the two indices here and the RMSCA. And so, these tell you approximate fit. Right. And so the CFI and the TLI give you an incremental fit, uh, incremental fit idea. And the RMSCA gives you a absolute, an absolute fit. Uh, and so that's how those work. Now we've got our squares here because I asked for those. We have our parameter estimation. So we have our estimates here that you'll see. Question three has a bit of a problem in factor one. So maybe that is leading to because you can see that it is a negative factor loading as whereas everything else is a positive factor loading. And here we go. Here's our model fit. And so we have our um, auto loads, our auto correlations here. Um, and then we have our factor loadings from factors to items, 0 0.67, 0 0.95. You can see here that item three uh, has this negative 0.6. And you can see that they are correlated with one another. Um, in one of the model options is we can assume that the factors are uncorrelated, which is not appropriate. It's not appropriate in this one. But if you do, if you check what happens here, we say these models are uncorrelated, if these factors are uncorrelated, letting my computer work here for a second. You can see that this changed to zero and you can see all of these changed to zero. But let's go back up, see, chi-square got bigger, um, still, um, still significantly lower than um, 0 0.001. But look at what happened to the CFI and the TLI. They sank, uh, they sank down. So we have a bad fit if we say that these um, factors are uncorrelated. Um, and then our RMSCA here, 0.152, that's also very, very bad. Um, and so, uh, and, and you can see our p-value here is less than 0 0.001. It's not zero, so it's not good. It's not good. Um, and so we actually have to assume that these factors are correlated, and it makes sense in the context of the actual items of this test.
So there we go. Now, let me go ahead and put in all eight of them. All right. So that's, oh, and then the misfit, oh, actually, before I do that, the misfit plot tells you if um, some of these questions don't really fit with the other ones. So you can see that question seven doesn't really fit well with um, question one and question three. And question six, same over here. So you can sort of find out uh, a little bit more in your factor, in, in this confirmatory factor analysis, so after you've done the EFA, whether or not this particular sample has some differences that you may not have seen in the exploratory factor uh, analysis because that doesn't come with a misfit plot. All right, so one last thing, I wanna show you what happens if we just combine all of these um, into, so I'm gonna select all of them. So I'm gonna select, select question one to question eight, holding shift so it does all of them, and I'm gonna put them all into factor one. And so you can see that it put in two, six, and seven here at the bottom. And let's scroll back up. I mean, I could have duplicated this to, to show you, but you can always just scroll back and forth in the video. So here you can see chi-square, massive number, still, I mean, with the degrees of freedom of 20, because of all of the numbers of people in this. So P is less than 0 0.001, but, but look at my, my CFI and my TLI. It's far less than what we need to expect for our cutoffs, right? So at least 0 0.9, they're below that significantly. Now, if we go to the RMSCA, right, we have a value of 0 0.102. So we are above that 0 0.01 threshold. Not good, not good at all. And uh, you can see our p-value here is um, our, our p-value here is very small. So what you want is a low RMSCA and a high p-value. So you can say that yes, this is a good fit. That's that's how you look at that p-value there. And if we go over here to this factor model, you can see that you know uh, item three is still having some problems with factor one. Um, item uh, two is still having some problems, which I think is why it was dropped from the two item. And you can see that question six and question seven um, are having some, and then question two having a misfit with uh, question three a little bit. And so this is not a good model and you need to work on it. Of course, again, you would be coming from an EFA on a new set of data for this CFA. So, you know, doing the SEM is more confirmatory. You are, you are exploring the model more. So that is how you do a confirmatory factor analysis in JASP. Please leave your comments, suggestions, and feedback down below. Again, I will link the UCLA page that I was using to explore this with you all. Um, if you like this video, please leave a like. If you like this content, please consider subscribing for more stats tutorials. Thanks for watching. Bye.